If clothes make the man, consider Henry VIII. This is the most famous image of him after Holbein, 1536. And here you can see he's absolutely encrusted in gold. And jewels. In Henry's day, you wore your wealth. It was embroidered onto your doublet, pounds and pounds of it, if you were king. By law, the only man in England allowed to wear this much finery. Imagine him here, at Hampton Court Palace. He had loads of palaces. He had 60, in fact, 60. and he moved between them. Lucy Worsley is chief curator for England's historic royal palaces. He always looked forward to coming here because this is the place that he came for hunting, holidays and honeymoons. It was a pleasure palace. Southwest of London along the River Thames, Hampton Court is where Henry VIII plotted his divorces and multiple remarriages and where, according to a letter written at the time, he himself, yes, Henry VIII, may have taken up embroidery. The way it is written, you could read it as though he was actually doing the embroidery. A bizarre piece of trivia, not for Susan K. Williams. So this is a piece that needs a lot of TLC. She runs the Royal School of Needlework, which just happens to be located at Hampton Court Palace and specializes in hand embroidery. Here we have um, a very splendid piece. This is Carpenter's Cope from Salisbury Cathedral. A walk through its workrooms will make it instantly clear why, in the 21st century, there's a need for such a school, considered the best in the world. But th this is a really striking example of embroidery as art. At every table, textile treasures. Here we have what's known as naturalistic silk shading because it goes around the corner. Silk shading is like painting with thread. There are dozens of different stitches. Stem stitch, satin stitch, bullion knots, French knots. Black work just uses black thread and you get the shading from the thickness of the black thread that you use. By the mid-19th century, thanks to changing fashion and mechanization, these techniques were being lost. So in 1872, Lady Victoria Welby opened the school with two goals in mind. One was in order to keep hand embroidery alive, and the other was to provide um, working opportunities for ladies that would otherwise um, be destitute. Once they were trained, the women could make a living producing embroidery. The school sold their work in its own showrooms and took on private commissions. Queen Victoria agreed to be the school's patron, her daughter Princess Helena president, which is how Royal was added to its name. This is the building that's opened in 1875, and here we can see Princess Helena in her carriage, and it's a grand occasion. This is the place to be seen. Lynn Hulse is the RSN's historian. So the Queen and this mother. is the Queen Mother here um, in a very earlier stage in her life. when she's She arranged the move to Hampton Court Palace. So this would have been for the coronation of her husband, George VI. The Royal School of Needlework embroidered the robe she wore when he was crowned in 1937. And the robe her daughter, Queen Elizabeth, the RSN's current patron, wore in 1953. This is a sample of the embroidery, made with 18 different kinds of gold thread. The embroiderers were not allowed home during the period they were embroidering the coronation robe because no one was to know what the design was. How long did it take? Three months. But working on the next coronation robe is not every student's dream project. Like I've been sewing skulls and things like that. Not your typical sampler. When Kirsten Fitzgerald enrolled last fall, her friends asked, Isn't it just full of grannies? I'm like, no, most of us are quite young. We're not sort of all 80. <laughs> Students are all ages and come from all over the world, with and without career aspirations. You wind the twist around the shaft of the needle. The school offers everything from day classes to a three-year degree course. Just leave a little loop come up inside that loop with a needle. And yes, there are men in the school. 
Could you also work that with colour? So In Henry VIII's time, professional embroiderers were all men. I look at some pieces afterwards and I think, wow, I worked on that. These women were the best students, who considered it a privilege to stay and work on restoration projects and commissions. Amanda Barry for 18 years. Um, you got to be patient. Yeah, a good back always helps. For Margaret Dyer, after 17 years, there's the satisfaction of value added. Just means that a bit of me is going into that and it will be there after I've gone. You could hear the proverbial pin drop, or more likely a needle, in this room filled with history, in a quiet part of the palace where once Henry VIII himself may have taken up embroidery.